Thank you guys, good to be here. Um, first of all, uh, th as you introduced me, my name is Mishko, and uh, I have to tell you a little bit about AngularJS. I'm going to do a little uh, spiel for myself. As I said, I work for Google, um, and I work on AngularJS. How many people have heard of it? Good, you guys using it? No? All right, well, we'll, we'll, we'll work on that later. But anyways, I'm not here to talk about AngularJS. I am here to talk about testing. Um, and uh, I, I like questions, so you know, don't make this monotone for me. I've heard this presentation before. So ask some good questions and uh, we'll, we'll take it from there. So there's three things you need to know about test things. Um, so what are those three things? Well, you need to learn how to read code. And you say, well, wait a minute, I've been writing code for so long, why do I need to know how to read it? Well, it turns out that we, are, we have been reading the code for the wrong way. You remember Matrix when the characters are kind of falling down? and a guy plugs it in the back of his head and he says, you know, I don't need to plug it in anymore, I can just look at the characters and how they fall and I see the beautiful blonde, I think he says, walking by. Well, it's the same thing with testable code, is that people, when they look at code, all they see is the actual uh, behavior of it, rather than seeing how the code is structured and how, what kind of implications that have for testability. And so one of the things I want to talk about is how do we focus on the testability part so that you can see past the code and into the testability realm. The other thing about testing is it's all about managing your dependencies and there's different kinds of dependencies, we'll, we'll go over them. And finally, um, it's the old joke about sharpening your axe, you, you heard about this, which is that, you know, there's a guy trying to chop the axe and a consultant walks by and says, you know, if you sharpen that thing, you'll chop, uh, sharp, uh, chop it down much faster. And he says, I don't have time to sharpen it, I have to chop down all these trees. No, not funny? All right. <laughs> So it turns out that you know, sharpening your axe in terms of setting up the environment so that doing the right thing is easier than doing the wrong thing is, is a big part of it. So why do I test? Anybody has any ideas? I'm not asking why you test, I'm saying why do I do it? Yes? For the sheer joy of it. For the sheer joy of it. Uh, I don't, maybe. Uh, the reason I write this is because it turns out that writing the test is easier than running my application. You know, to run an application, you have to start up a server, and there's probably some JVM involved. It takes you know, a few seconds to, even if you're doing everything right, it takes a few seconds to start up. If you're doing everything maybe not so right, it takes a couple of minutes. I don't know what your experience is. And then, you know, it takes forever to navigate to a particular location of the application, and you say, oh man, the, the, the list of things is in the wrong order, I gotta change the equality sign. So you go back to equality sign, you recompile it, and you go through the whole startup procedure again. And it takes forever, and it turns out that if you have your environment set up correctly, uh, writing the test is simply easier than going through this whole ordeal of, writing, of uh, running the application. And so I want to give you a couple of numbers. This is real numbers actually from AngularJS project. And it shows lines of code. And uh, uh, specifically, uh, CL is a terminology for change list or uh, you know, individual commit. So I kind of analyzed my, my uh, commits and I came to the conclusion there's about 1,300 commits. Um, and there's a number of lines of code that you have over there and which portion of the code is JavaScript and Ruby and what the ratio is between the production and test code. And I want you to look at it and see the ratio over there and, and basically you see that there's approximately uh, one to one correspondence between the lines of test code and lines of production code. And so the first obvious thing is, aha, uh -huh, I have to write twice as much code, therefore it's gonna take me twice as much, twice as long to write it. Well, that's actually not true, and that's part of the myth I want to talk about. And specifically, I want you to look at the bottom. And it says how many hours I spend on writing the production code versus how many hours I spend writing the test code. And it turns out that I spend only about 10% of my time writing the, product, uh, the test code. And you say, well, how can it be? How can you write so much more code, and yet so little of it is actually spent in, in writing the test? And the reason for it is over here. Clearly you can read this tiny font, right? <laughs> no, that's not what I want to uh, show you. I, I specifically made the font too small for you to see. And on the left hand side is production code, on the right hand side is test code. You see anything different? Nesting. The what? Nesting. nesting, exactly. That's what makes it hard. Uh, it turns out that the, the nesting or the indentation as it flows in and out is a sign of for loops, if statements, basically conditions, right? A blocks that get executed conditionally. Whereas if you look at the right-hand side where there's tests, 
it is flat. There is nothing, right? It's all, uh, you know, do this, do this, do this, and the next step. And it turns out writing is not the, the reason why writing the uh, writing application takes a long time is not because you can't type fast enough, right? Uh, that's not the problem. It's not the typing that's limiting us. It's the actual scratching your head and trying different things and trying to figure out what algorithm actually does the right thing and how do I set up the if statements and then realizing I've done something wrong, have to go back to refactor it, and on and on and on. Um, and so the reason I spent so much more time on the left-hand side is because, well, it's just the more complicated side versus the right-hand side, which is pretty straightforward. So how do we write code? Well. We, uh, we spend most of our time in the red box. This is where we put the bugs in, that's why it's red. Then we go into the green box and we do a little bit of testing to see if what we have written works. I mean, we're kind of going back and forth through this all the time. And finally, at some point, we're like in happy medium and we check it in. And specifically, what I want to talk about is we do this manually, this test step, or most of us do, right? And we would like to automate it so that, well, computer can do this for us. Um, because then you can benefit from the fact that not only can you run the test today or for this particular implementation, but all the time in the future when somebody else will come after you and will try to change some behavior, tests become a set of assumption about the code base. And so I've never met anybody who has not followed this diagram. Even if you, I hope nobody still does waterfall over here, but even if you do waterfall, this is still what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. So, Testing is not like frosting. What I mean by that is testing has to be baked in from the very, very beginning into your uh, development process. You know, most people have this idea that, oh, I'm a software engineer, I will go and uh, write a whole bunch of code, and I'm gonna throw it all the fence, and then there's some um, a test engineer or QA or somebody whose job it is to write a whole bunch of tests and to prove that you know, the stuff won't, won't break. And it turns out this particular model is very broken, and we'll, we'll talk about why. And what I'm trying to, one of the biggest things that I'm trying to get people to understand is that it is the responsibility of the engineer himself or herself to implement the tests as part of it. And hopefully write the test before the implementation, but that's a separate discussion. So how many of you guys test drive? Crickets? One person? Okay. Uh, oh, there's a couple more over there. So do you agree that this is, has to be done as part of the development process? Yes, good. Um, so, you know, if you're going to bake yourself a cake and you're going to forget to put a sugar, no matter how much sugar you put on the top, it's never going to taste as good as if you bake the sugar in. Um, now, here is a, for, for a long while I was walking around and trying to convince people they should do tests. And I got a whole bunch of excuses why people don't do tests. And, you know, I kind of enumerated them over here, and, and I'm not going to go through it. I'm going to say some of them are actually semi valid, like saying that, uh, well, I have a whole bunch of legacy code, and I, it's really hard to write tests, so I tend not to. And while this is not a good excuse long term, uh, I understand that it's more difficult than having a code base that's uh, test friendly. But the one excuse, the big red box in the top, that nobody ever says, is no uh, does it, it it's, it's slower it's already covered all right here here is what nobody ever says i don't know how and it turns out this is the reason why most people don't do testing is because they don't know how it turns out it's a skill it's a skill like any other skill right uh, you but what, what i find especially interesting about this is that you go to somebody and you say do you know javascript and they'll proudly say, no, I do not. Whereas you go to somebody and you say, do you know how to write a test, uh, how to write code, testable code? And they'll be ashamed to say they do not know this particular thing. They'll say, of course I know how to write a test. Why are you even asking me? Uh, so why is it that we can admit freely that we don't know something like a programming language or a particular framework or something like that, but we have a hard time admitting that we don't know a particular style of writing code when the style of writing code is, is similarly important. So it turns out that don't know how is, is the big thing over here. Now, as I said, this is the kind of the, the development process and so that we have software engineers and this is where they put the bugs in, in the red box. And then we have usually some kind of a QA department that tries to do manual or exploratory testing. 
And sooner or later they get bored with this for good reasons and they say, well, we need to automate it. And so they look for tools to automate the testing and look for what I call the testing magic. The trouble is there is no testing magic at that level because the best thing you can do is make a framework that pretends to be a user. That's the best you can do. And that has all kinds of problems which we'll get into later on. But more importantly, uh, the issue is that the people who write the test are not the same people who write the code. And so any uh, mistakes that are done in writing the code are not felt by the same person. So person A is creating pain and person B is feeling the pain. Right? What incentive does person A have to change his behavior? Nothing. Whereas if you make, if you close the loop and you say, no, 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 you, person A over here, you have to write both the code and the test, very quickly that person will realize, this is not the best way to write code uh, because they feel their own pain. Uh, and so the only way to really to get people to, be, to change their behavior in the way the code is implemented is really to have them feel their own pain. And so the big point I'm trying to make here is that testing magic really has to happen at the development time. It's not something you can do afterwards. So let's talk about this matrix here over here. And my favorite question on interviews is, imagine you're an evil developer. How would you write hard to test code? Yes. Include random number generators. Include random number generators. And how, how would that make code hard to test? Unpredictable. Okay, so it's true. Uh, random number generators would make it a little bit more difficult to test, but that in itself is not really what makes it hard to test. Anybody else? Tons of external dependencies. Tons of external dependencies. Are right, we getting closer? Uh, you can test code with external dependencies, but depending on how these dependencies are gotten, it might be either easy or straightforward, or next to impossible. Turns out. Uh, most people that ask this question give me all kinds of answers and I find this interesting because it's almost as if writing hard to test code is innate in software developers. <laughs> like it has to be unlearned, you know, it's like a, like a spider that, that, that knows, is born and knows how to make web. We software developers, we are born and we know how to write hard to test code and we have to unlearn a whole bunch of things. Uh, so the person who can actually answer this question is you know that that person actually knows how to write testable code. So let me, let me give you an example. Here is a piece of code and um, it, it was designed to be hard to test. And I'm going to give you a second to read over it. And I want you to kind of think about what makes the code hard to test. And remember, as I, we talked previously about this matrix, this ability to see past the code, where here's what I'm going to make a guess as to what 99% of you are doing. You're reading the code and you're trying to understand what the code does. Yes? Okay, why? This isn't a question about what the code does. This is a question about, is it easy to test? And it turns out, the question of, is it easy to test, is a question of code structure, not of code behavior. Uh, and so it's not about what the code does. I don't care if this thing is launching a space shuttle into Mars. Uh, the, the important thing is how exactly is it structured? And this thing is so, this is so ingrained in us to be able to look at the code and immediately try to figure out well, what does it do? Because for you know, X number of years we have done nothing but trying to figure out the code that we never look past it. So I'm gonna help you out of here and I'm gonna rename everything. I'm gonna obfuscate everything, okay. Is this code easier or harder to test? It's the same, right? Yes, we made it harder for human to understand what's going on, but any code I could have written in a previous version, I could have written in this version. As a matter of fact, this is standard obfuscation that people do all the time with JavaScript, right? It doesn't make it uh, the code any more or less anything. As far as the, 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 the computer is concerned, it's the same piece of code. The identifiers are thrown away anyways at runtime. So this makes the, uh, this is basically the same exact piece of code and so we're going to help you out now and I'm going to show you the green boxes. These are the boxes that you have full control over in a test, right? So if I say new class A, whatever the class A happens to be, I have full control and I can pass in the D, right? That means that variable I control. Uh, so I can pass in a, a mock, I can pass in a friendly, 
I can pass in whatever I want. I get to control this variable d. I get to override its method. So for example, method d.a, I get to control and so on. And so let's color code a couple more things. And these are, these yellow things are the second level of indirections, which means while I cannot directly control b, I can control, if I pass in a mock of d, I can then control the way uh, the second level of indirection gets generated. So through clever use of mocking techniques and polymorphism, etc., you could maybe get a hold of B and C. And this is a third level of indirection, again, of trying to mock things out to get to level, uh, level uh, to the third level. Now notice, we have been mocking like crazy and we have gotten nowhere interesting inside of our application. What we really want to do is want to be able to go into the code and get a hold of all of the interesting bits so that we can cause exceptions to happen, to, so we can cause uh, error conditions to happen, so we can uh, test different paths and verify different paths and so on. And as it stands right now, um, this isn't going to be a very easy thing to do. And keep in mind that every time you have to write a mock, have you guys used uh, mocking frameworks? Like they're wonderful, right? But they are so wordy. There, there's so much work in setting them up and then setting the expectations up. What happens is your, your, your mock setup code tends to drown out. It, it acts like a noise. It, it, it has so much noise that the, that the actual thing you're testing is just covered somewhere deep down and you have you know, 50 lines of setup code and like two lines of actual doing the test. This is not how uh, good tests are written. So. What we want to do here is we want to refactor this. We want to uh, say, can we restructure this application in a way, or this piece of code, in a way that it's more malleable to testing? And so the answer to this thing is this. It's the same piece of uh, method A, but what I've done is I've changed the constructor. Notice, instead of asking for things and then calling methods and fetching stuff and doing levels of indirections, I've simply asked for the stuff that I actually needed. And there's this, this uh, principle called uh, law of Demeter violation. You guys are familiar with it? Law of Demeter? Nobody has heard of it? Yes, a couple of people have a law of Demeter. Look it up. Uh, basically what it says is that if you need, if you go to a store and you need to pay for an item that you want to buy, then you should simply hand over the money for this particular item to the clerk, rather than having the clerk reach into your pocket, pull out your wallet and pull the money he needs. Uh, but that's what happens all the time, right? If I back up a second, if you notice the constructor, that's what's happening, right? D is the user, D.B gives me the, the wallet, dot .C, that gives me the money, right? So whenever you see this whole long list of dot notations, you're basically looking for things. And that makes it hard to test because in my test, I have to create, instead of just creating the $10 that I could use for the test, and I have to create $10, a wallet, and a user, and I have to put the wallet into the uh, user's pocket, right? And then go through the whole testing procedure. Does that kind of make sense? Yes? Okay. So what I want you to take away from this is that what the code does is irrelevant. What matters is how the code is structured. Uh, that's the only thing that matters for testability. And this is a hopefully a relevation for some of you? Yes? So also, these are the typical things that people say that makes the code hard to test. They say, well, I make things private, I'm going to use the final keyword, I'm going to have long methods, I'm going to um, name my methods in French, or something like that. But the real issue is actually the structure, and specifically, it's the mixing the new with logic, and we'll, we'll cover the specific things. Looking for things, which is the law of the mirror violations. Doing work in constructor, because uh, constructor is something that you're going to have to instantiate and call inside of your tests all the time. And if you're going to do work inside of the constructor, then you're going to have to successfully navigate through this constructor in every single test. Again, you don't want to do this. A global state, which you pointed out with the math random number generator, is an, is an example of global state. Uh, singletons is just a fancy way of saying global state. Uh, we can talk about those later. Static methods because, well, they can't be overridden, so you cannot change the way application executes. We'll, we'll talk about it more. Deep inheritance is another way because constructors can't be overridden, only the methods can be overridden. 
and so you are forced to run through the whole constructor, uh, all the constructors in the hierarchy, and if every single step in the hierarchy does something like, well, I don't know, talks to a database, or sends an email or something crazy like that, uh, makes it really super hard to write a test for it. So what can I tell you about writing tests? Turns out nothing. And so if you came here to learn how to write tests, I'm gonna have to disappoint you because this is not that talk that you're looking for. What I'm gonna talk about is a whole bunch of about how do you structure the codes for testability. And it turns out if you came to a project that has been writing tests and everybody on the team knows these principles and the code on the team is, the code is very uh, test friendly, you would have no problems writing these tests. They would simply write themselves because it would be simply a natural thing to do in the way the code is structured. I can tell you more about dependency injection, which is the big thing that uh, makes testing possible. Uh, I can talk to you about test-driven development, uh, and I can tell you a whole lot about what makes code uh, untestable and, and what kind of structures that are common in programming uh, make the code untestable. So really there's no secret to writing tests, there's only secret to writing testable code. So how do we get to writing tests, so, uh, writing unit tests? So you know, there's different levels of writing tests. There's there's end-to-end -end tests, there's unit tests, and there's everything in between. So I want to take you through the progression. Uh, when first I started writing tests, the the, the first thing that that popped into my mind was, ooh, I know, I'm going to write a framework that will pretend to be a user, and then it will click on stuff on a screen, and that's how I'm going to test my application. Right? And this, that's the first thing everybody thinks of, and it sounds like a good idea, but it turns out if you do this, you have a very, um, you, you discover that your tests are very, very slow. And you also discover that your tests are very flaky because the setup process is complex, the, the teardown process is complex, uh, and there's just so many things that are involved in it. Have you got, had this experience? Yes, okay, good. So you say, well, what can I do? Well, first you're gonna realize, well, if things are green, you're very happy because you go, wow, you know, I've executed this one test case and it, it exercised half of my code base. And so I know that at least half of the code base is good. And so you you have high confidence when it's green. But when it fails, the, the error could be anywhere in that half of the code base, which is huge, right? Most, and because the tests are really slow and usually cumbersome to run, they're super difficult to debug. Um, and as I said earlier, they're flaky. So why are they flaky? Well, they're flaky because there's all these complex dependencies and they usually return things slower. So for example, there's a mail server and the mail server has a hiccup for whatever reason. And instead of returning in 0.1 milliseconds, it takes two seconds to return. And so your piece of code that says click here, wait three seconds and click over there, all of a sudden doesn't work because the server doesn't respond fast enough. And then just everything breaks. So you say, well, I know what I'm gonna do. I am going to take the external dependencies and I'm going to chop it up so that I can say instead of having a real server I talk to, I am going to have a fake authentication server, I'm going to have a fake backend, and maybe a fake um, email server, and by splitting it up into smaller pieces, you're narrowing the things that could go wrong, but you're also making sure that these things that you are faking out, like authentication, uh, are less likely to fail on your particular application. And so by doing that, you are now getting closer to what we would call a functional test, where only a portion of it would fail. And it turns out these tests are way faster because they don't have a lot of these dependencies. And they also are much better when things are failing, you kind of know what's going on. And so the, the whole thing kind of repeats, but it, it's more focused. But the real thing comes in when you say, hmm, I took the whole application and I chopped it out and I replace the, the individual components with things, but what if I can do the same thing with individual classes? What if I can take the individual classes and simply test the class that's responsible for sorting my email, right? If the email should be sorted by importance, and there's this complicated algorithm by which we decide which email is more important than the other one, then I should be able to instantiate the, the sorter alg algorithm without instantiating the rest of the system. Right? I shouldn't be forced to say, you know, have the authentication uh, server up and running if I just want to test the email sorting algorithm. And so this is what the unit testing is all about, is to, is to say, can I focus on individual classes? So that when things fail, I know exactly where to go. And because I focus on individual classes, it turns out that, um, that 
the speed at which these tests can execute uh, is very, very fast. So, so you can literally execute thousands of tests in a second if they're written well. Whereas there's no way you can execute that many end-to-end -end tests um, on your application. So I'm going to skip around for a bit. Um, what is, when you have different kinds of tests, you should kind of end up with this kind of a pyramid. What I mean by this is that you need to have lots and lots of unit tests. These are the individual classes that you wanted to test themselves. Um, and these tests are very, very fast. So as I said, you can have thousands of them, and then when you have thousands of them, you can actually be in a situation where you execute all of the, the tests you have on every save. How crazy is that? Executing your tests on every save. You can do that, because if they take one second to, exec to execute, nothing stops you from hooking up your IDE to trigger the execution and reporting to you if you broke anything. And that's actually how I work. Uh, and I think it's a very wonderful way of working where you don't have to even start up your application. You simply sit there, write your tests, prove that the particular classes work, they work together and so on, and it's way faster than actually going on and starting the application. As I said, we also have a next level test, which are the functional tests or scenario tests, all the way on the top. These tests are going to be much slower so that you are unlikely to be able to hook them up uh, and execute them on every, uh, on every save. Uh, but they're important. The, the thing is though, because they take so much longer to, to execute, you probably want to have fewer of them. So you want, this is why we have this pyramid, because we, have, we want to have a large number of unit tests, and as we go up the pyramid, as the test gets lower, uh, we also want to get fewer of them. But it turns out that these tests does different things. So unit test is all about, does the class do the right thing, or to put it differently, uh, are the if statements, all the indentation you have seen earlier, is the indentation correct? Which means are the loops, if statements, and so on correct? This is what the unit tests are testing. What functional tests are really testing is contract between classes. You know, I could have very easily written two classes that both internally are correct, but when they are put together, uh, the contract between them, you know, they're misunderstanding the contract, and so they could be doing the wrong thing together. And so, functional test is not really a test of does the individual class does the right thing. It's more of a test of is the contract between the classes correct. And finally, scenario tests are much more a test of is the system wired in, wired up correctly. You know, I could have very well maybe hooked up a wrong authentication LDAP. Uh, directory to my system and so now I'm authenticated against the wrong thing and so maybe I want to have an end-to-end -end test to prove that yes I can I, you know all the pieces are actually there and so scenario tests are all about wiring problem and we'll, we'll talk about that more later I want to skip this in the interest of time and we're going to talk about dependencies so there's a lot of different kinds of dependencies um, you know there's compile time dependencies there is a runtime dependencies but the ones we're really interested in are how objects get references to each other. So let me show this example. This is a unit test, right? You have your class under test, and then you have your, uh, the test that you're writing. So the test exercises the class under test probably instantiates it, calls some methods on it, and then it asserts that the output is correct. This is really what we're talking about. This is what a unit test is, right? So if this is all there is, why are we even here? If it's this simple, what's missing out of this diagram? The dependencies, yes. So, if the class under test was, I don't know, math.absolute value, we would have no trouble writing a unit test for this. I don't think anybody in this room would, would be scratching their heads how to test that particular method. The reason why it's easy to test that method is because it's a leaf. It, there's no more dependencies after math.absolute value. But the class we have usually have other classes that are the dependencies. And the world would be okay if it would be just one level. Except those classes have other classes, and those classes have other classes, and, then, and then so on and so forth. And this is usually a nice small application. I'm sure if you drew a diagram for your application, this thing would not fit on a screen. You know, you, you probably run out of pixels. You probably have more, more dependencies than the pixels or something like that, you know? So really the problem here isn't writing the test. The problem here is managing the dependencies. Now I put a little yellow box in the center over there and I call it the seam. 
And it turns out this is what testing is about. This is about being able to get a hold of the seam. If I can get a hold of the seam, in other words, if I can, <clears throat> if I can direct the way the code executes and instead of going to the typical dependency, I can put a fake dependency over there or maybe a dependency configured a different way, then I can uh, assert the system. So what we're looking for is a way to replace all the dependencies with friendlies so that the complex system, complex of dependencies becomes something like this. Now what are friendlies? Well, it could be a lot of different things. Uh, first of all, it could be mocks, those are the most obvious ones. But it could actually be the real actual classes, but they could be configured in a special way. Suppose one of these things would be, was a cache. And in production, your cache is configured to have, I don't know, million uh, rows before it causes a uh, cache overflow when somebody gets ejected. If you are trying to instantiate the real production cache and you have trying to write a test, you're gonna have a hard time because you're gonna have a hard time filling out the cache and causing an overflow, right? It's gonna probably take up all this, the memory, the test is gonna be slow, and so on. And, but if I could instantiate a cache it ch uh, changes parameters so that it has a, 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 a cache size of one, I could very quickly cover all the uh, corner cases of you know, cache misses, preloading the cache, and so on. And by having a reference to the cache, I can play tricks on the class under test where uh, I can secretly go behind the class under test and I can talk to the cache directly and I can insert things and eject things and just simulate all kinds of scenarios. I can have the cache throw exceptions and so on that I cannot do unless I can get a hold of the dependencies. So it turns out all of this is about managing the dependencies. Now, how do we get dependencies in classes? There's, turns out there's three ways to do this. You can call the new operator on your dependency. You can uh, have the dependency be passed in through either a function or a constructor. And finally, you can go and look for the dependency in some global uh, variable. Do most of you guys think that global variables are a bad idea? Have we convinced the world yet? Okay, global variables are a bad idea, but it turns out that if we, uh, if we have global variables, but we call them something else, like, oh, I don't know, singletons, all of a sudden people think it's okay. So a singleton is just a global variable in the sheep's clothing, so don't believe the hype. It's still a global variable. And I'm gonna go take a little detour. It turns out there is, there is two kinds of singletons. There are what I call, for lack of a better name, singletons with capital S and singletons with lowercase s. The ones with a capital S is the ones that have a global variable somewhere inside of them that enforces its own singletonness. And there's also singletons in, with lowercase s, which is just a regular class where you happen to call the new operator once on it inside of your application. There's nothing wrong with the lowercase ones. There's nothing wrong with having one of something. The problem becomes when there's a global variable somewhere hidden in there and it enforces its own singletonness. But anyways, that's a little detour. So the whole trick over here is how do we get hold of the dependencies? And I said there's three ways. There's the, you can be instantiating, you can, be, you can pass the object in, and then you can look it up in a global variable. There's no other way to get yourself a dependency. And it turns out that the only one of those three is friendly to testing. Do you know which one? It's passing it in. That's the only one that's friendly to testing. If you pass in your dependency, that means that the test driver is responsible for making the dependency and it can choose to make the real dependency, make it in a different way, make, uh, create a subclass of the dependency, or create a mock of the dependency, and then pass it in. That's the only one that's friendly for testing. All the other ones are not. Uh, and so, part of the problem is that when we build uh, application, we mix what I call object graph construction and lookup with business logic. In other words, if you look at your code, you will often find that you have both the new operators as well as if statements together in the same class. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure that most of you never even thought about, hey, these things should not be together. And I'm gonna say, you need to really separate them out. In other words, you need to have classes that are either in the business of building other classes, which we call factories, or you have classes that actually do work, but they're not in the business of doing anything. And so the classes that are in the business of doing work, 
should say, well, I need, in order to get my work done, I need to have references to my dependencies. And I should simply declare these dependencies in the constructor. This is called dependency injection. Uh, and let's see if I remember this joke, I'm going to screw it up. Uh, dependency injection is like Chuck Norris. You don't look for your dependencies, you declare them. <laughs> so, now I derailed myself. Uh, right, so dependency injection is the trick to make this thing work. This is what we're trying to build. Notice how we have the test driver it is the thing that instantiates or is responsible for building all these dependencies. In other words, the test driver becomes the, the factory and then it then passes the, the dependencies through the constructor into the class under test and these dependencies come on the other side as friendlies and voila, we have an easy time writing tests. That's 90% of testing magic right there. So let's do some uh, hands-on stuff. So uh, here's our code again. And um, we're going to see if we can write a test. So this code is specifically designed to make code hard to test. In other words, in all my years I've been trying to teach people how to write testable code, I collected all of the creative ways that people write co make code hard to test. It is all inside of this one file. Can you spot them all? See, we haven't really developed our ability to see the following characters without that thing in the back of your head. So, the, as I said, this code was designed to slap you around. So, what do we have thrown in? We have thrown in a global state, aka singletons, law of the meter violations, global references to time, which is the same thing as having global reference to a random number generator. We have hard-coded a new operator, and we have total lack of dependency injection. So now, let's say you are that person on the other side of the fence who's responsible for writing a test. So, some engineer somewhere already written the code, and he tested it manually, and now you're supposed to write a test for it. When you are in that situation, you're gonna be very, very reluctant to go and change the code that already works. And so you're gonna try to write a test without touching the production code. And it turns out you're gonna have a really hard time. And here is a, I'm not gonna go through everything here, but I'm kind of just, on the left-hand side is the production code, and specifically, I look at the constructor. Constructor says funny stuff. It says, I need a config. Okay, why do you need config? Well, let's see. From the config, you get something called a certificate path. Aha, uh -huh, so that's probably a path to a certificate so that you can get the, the key, the certificate key, right? Because you're going to read it from a file. Okay, I got that. And then from config, I also get this other thing called the user. And from the user, I get the username and password. Now, notice what we have to do inside of the test. We have to make a config. We have to make a user. That's assuming that the user is easy to make. And given that this class is hard to make, I'm going to venture and say that the, the user was written by the same people, which means the user is going to be hard to make too. So this is like ideal world when things are actually easy to make. We have to set the username and password on it. We then have to take the user and pass it into the config object. We have to generate a temporary key, put it into a temporary file, write it out, uh, close the file, uh, set the temporary path file onto the config object, and then we can call the inbox syncer get, which is a singleton, which makes exactly one copy of ourselves, which means we can never ever reconfigure this particular uh, class in our unit test. This is it. For the rest of the JVM lifetime, we don't get to change anything in it. So now let's look at some more stuff. Uh, let's see, there's a reference to new date over there. That's going to be a pain because, well, it's going to be hard to simulate passage of time. Suppose this particular thing says, you know, I need to wait an hour to do something. Well, how are you going to, are you going to have your test wait an hour before it does something next? It's going to make for one slow test. Um, it, you know, instantiates something called the pop connector. Gee, I really would like to cause exceptions to happen, but because I'm instantiating the pop connector, Turns out it will do a socket, so I better start a server on the same machine with a different port number so that I can then pass the socket and pretend to be there, right? Um, and then of course I have to tear everything down. Pretty crazy, huh? So what's missing? Well, aren't you paying attention? Where's the test? Because this is, this is what we had to do just to get the class instantiated. Right? We still have to write a test. And this is what the test might look like. 
A couple of things I want you to look at it, and that is, if you write the test after the fact, you're going to have names like test sync. Super descriptive, isn't it? What does this test do? Anybody? You know, you're going to have to parse, scratch your head, try to reverse engineer it. But it turns out that if you have just went through the previous set of slides and uh, actually did all these steps in order to instantiate this thing, you're going to be so upset and so in a bad foul mood that you're probably going to get a really horrible job on this test sync and you're just probably going to test basic happy case and move on because at this point you had enough of this. So it's not going to be a very good test. But more importantly, imagine that for whatever reason you lost all of your production code and the only thing that was left behind was the test code. Would you be able to reconstruct your application? I'm guessing the answer is no. Because, well, as I said earlier, like it's really hard to understand what exactly the code is supposed to be doing looking at this particular test. So now let's flip the thing around and you know, let's forget about tests. Tests are so yesterday. Let's talk about executable specs. What are specs? Well, specs are just tests with sugar, and sugar makes everything go down easier. So let's talk about specs. And uh, let's make a couple of assumptions, which is that the code that we are about to write is yet to be written. Although the production code is, about, is, is yet to be written, it's not written, which means we get to write the test in a way we think it's easy for us. And then we let the implementation follow from there. And more importantly, we want our test to tell a story. So let me show you how. Suppose you had a test class that, that wrote something like this. It should sync messages from the PAP since the last sync. It should close the connection even when exception is thrown. It should sync messages only when not, all, uh, not already in the inbox. It should ignore a message older than the last sync, you know, and, and so on. If you read test uh, specs like these, you go like, I know what the code does. I can practically write the code, you know, after reading just the specification. And all we have done really is instead of focusing on testing individual methods, we're now talking about testing the behavior, right? We're describing the corner cases of this particular thing. But more importantly, instead of having this horrible complex setup, we might, we might, we might write something like this. We might say, long ago, new date one. You know? Hey, that's long ago. Uh, now, new date three. You know? So three milliseconds from now, that's the that's that three milliseconds from long time ago is now. And we can create a fake mock pop connector. You can say, I don't want the real one. We'll, we'll just give you a fake one because we don't want to be talking to actual server. Uh, we can just create an inbox instead of, you know, setting up a, a, a global variable over there. We can say, well, we don't want to do any filtering, so we'll just do the no-op filter. We can set up fake messages. But more importantly, check out the test. It says, it should sync message from pop since last sync. Hmm. How about I make two messages, one is long ago, and one is a past message, and then I instantiate a sinker and I pass all the relevant stuff in it, but I will say sync till now, but the last time I synced, I passed it to the constructor, was a long time ago. So what I would expect that the past message gets copied, but the long ago message doesn't, because that's before the last time I theoretically synced. And so then I write my assertions and I say, well, the get messages should equal to just the past message, not the past and the long ago message. And I also can assert that it has actually closed the connection. Right? This is stuff that you can read and understand and say, yes, I can see how writing these four lines or five lines is easier than starting a server. But it requires that the classes that I'm about to test cooperate. Now look at these are some more uh, tests that I could be writing, for example, and making sure the connection is, is, uh, is uh, thrown, uh, sorry, so the connection is closed even when the exception is thrown. I'm going to make a fake um, exception throwing filter by subclassing the regular filter, and I'm going to throw an exception. Notice I'm actually passing the exception I'm going to throw in, and I'm going to instantiate the sinker, and then I'm going to say sinker sync. And then I'm going to expect that I don't just get any exception, I get that specific one, which means that I'm actually testing that the exception is properly propagating. And I'm also going to verify that it actually got closed. And so this is something you wouldn't be able to do in the other uh, use case, right? Uh, and, and a couple other things to notice. Notice how I'm passing nulls everywhere. Basically, I'm saying, look, 
These are the parameters that have nothing to do with this test. Like the test fails, it's not because of this. You know, these are not the things you're looking for. So no is a good way to kind of just say, this isn't relevant to this particular test. And by shrinking the amount of things that are relevant, it makes it easier to figure out what's wrong with this code because you say, well, I know where to go look. I mean, clearly it's not gonna be over there because that class is never in, in, even mentioned in this particular test. So finally, um, what might, uh, what might an implementation look like given this implementation? So here is an example of what the sync method might look like. And the thing that you should notice, what's missing out of it, is the new operator, except for the new date, because Java's API for working with dates is a little bizarre. Um, but for the most part, there are no new operators. We don't make our references. We simply expect that things are there. Also notice that we don't have too many, we don't have any uh, law of the middle violations. We don't say a.b.c. whatever. We simply say we need pop and we just call a method on it directly. We don't try to get it. We don't look for the username and password. We simply get the username and password and uh, work with it. But more importantly, look at the constructor. Notice how the constructor doesn't do anything and it simply asks for what it means. And so a good way of looking at code uh, is, you know, when people say I'm having a hard time writing a test, the first thing when I look at their code is I, look, I go after the constructor. I want to see what is the constructor doing. And I look for a couple of things. Is the list of fields declared matching the list of fields inside of the constructor? I want to know is the things that you're actually going to operate on, are, that, are those the same things you're actually asking the external world to have? In other words, constructor is kind of like your public contract with the world. This is what you're saying you need in order to get your job done. And so you, what you don't want to do is you don't want to be lying. You don't want to be saying, oh, I don't need, uh, I don't know, username, password, whatever. It's in, and instead you're saying, I need this general thing could config and then go look for all the dependencies and kind of build yourself up because it makes it really hard to kind of reverse engineer your stuff. Like if you're going to ask for something as a config, how do I know how to configure the application so the right stuff is there without looking at the source code? Whereas if you follow this convention, you know, any IDE that does auto completion will tell you how to instantiate this thing. You just make a syncer and then you pass in all the instances of this stuff and you're done. So, in the review, I said new operators are kind of dangerous. Ask for what you need, don't do a law of demeter violation, and global state is nightmare. And so is doing work in constructor. So lastly is environment. Um, the, the trick to getting everybody uh, on the team to do the right thing is simply that you set up their environment in such a way that writing, doing the right thing has to be easier than doing the wrong thing, right? And I, so many times I come to projects and you know, sit down and I say, okay, show me how you launch the product. And you, know, you sit down and it takes half an hour to build and then 20 minutes to launch. And right there you go like, mm, you know, you're making life difficult for everybody. Like it would be really worth the time if somebody spent uh, you know, a whole lot of time over there and figuring out how to just make the developer's life easier. And it's not just that because, you know, suppose you have a project like that and you say, okay, I'm, I'm really going to be a good guy. I'm going to try to write a test. And all of a sudden you are faced with this uh, monolithic thing that refuses to have a test written on it. It's going to be really, really hard for you to do this. And so you're going to say, you know what, screw it. I'm just going to do it the old fashioned way, implement what I think needs to be done and then suffer through 20 minutes startup time and do the actual implementation. So on the other hand, when I work on my projects, I really focus on the environment. And it, it's hard to have a general descriptive thing of what exactly that means. But it typically means having the right tools, having the right IDE set up, having just everything just work seamlessly so that you can focus on one thing, writing code. And all the other stuff needs to be, you know, it, it, there can't be any distraction. And it's very important that, that engineers don't have to wait for things. Because if I have to wait for things like five seconds, I flip over and I go to my email and I never come back. And I'm sure you guys all have the same experience, right? You just cannot get me distracted. Like any excuse for distraction, I'm, I'm not coming back. So in my, when I develop my projects, I have this thing always set up that whenever I change anything and I hit the save key, my unit test immediately executes. 
And that's a very good um, goal to have. So for example, if you're using Eclipse, Eclipse compiles as you type. And because it compiles as you type, uh, if it's set up properly, essentially your code base is always compiled and always ready to run. So all you have to do is tell Eclipse and save, execute the shell script, which happens to run all the tests, which are passed, and then report the, uh, the response into the console, and then inside of the console you can just look at it and you see if anything that you have just done has broken anything. And then when you have a situation like this, instead of running the test you know, on before you commit, or end, on end of the day, or you know, once an hour, because the tests are running all the time, when they fail, and you don't expect them to fail, like, because you're doing an operation, you say, I'm gonna refactor this, and this should have no effect on anything. So you do the refactoring, and all of a sudden the test fails. Right, and you have to figure out what went wrong. It's so much easier to say, well, let me use this magic key called Apple Z, and all of a sudden my tests are green, versus, you know, I'm going to break something, I don't know that I broke it, and I'm going to be ready to commit, and by the time I'm ready to commit, you know, I've changed 50 other things, and now something is failing, and good luck figuring out what it was. By pulling it in, you can have a much better experience. And instead of debugging, really, your control Z becomes this amazing friend to you, because you just undo whatever you just done, and you go back to the green state. So, there's other things that I've done in the past that I'd like to share with you. So for example, this is a chart uh, of a team. Uh, each bubble is a commit. The, the height on the graph of the bubble is how far away you are, what's the ratio of test versus production code. In other words, if a bubble is at the zero, like some of the bubbles over there, it means that uh, you have done nothing but production code with zero tests. If the bu bubble is on the top, which means you've done nothing but tests and no production code, which means you are in the, you know, you, somebody, some other poor person is feeling the pain of the other guy writing the code. What you want is you want bubbles in the center. And uh, the size of the bubble is the size of the, the change. Uh, and this is uh, time in this particular direction. And so for example, you can see that over time, these particular project has gotten more serious about writing tests because there's a little bit of an upward trend over there. And more importantly, these large monolithic CLs at zero have kind of disappeared over time. So this is an example of how you can mod motivate the rest of your team to do the right thing. Okay, how are we doing on time? Five minutes? Okay, I'm gonna go really quickly for, for, through this thing because I think this is fun. Uh, and then I'm gonna open it up to questions. So, there are three kinds of bugs. Uh, the first one is I call the scorpion bug because it really bites you and bites you hard. And it's a problem of I thought about the problem and my thinking was wrong. So it's a thinking or really understanding of the problem. And I'll, I'll give you an example of it. Basically, this is the if statements and the while loops and so on. There is the spider problem, which is a wiring problem. Whereas individual stuff is correct, but when I wired it, everything together, my factory classes have hooked up the inputs to the outputs, or they send the wrong username, or the passwords is wrong, or things are reversed, or who knows what else. This has a nice property that usually the applications that are miswired usually fail spectacularly right at the beginning. And finally, there is the, the ladybug, which is kind of a benign, it just kind of looks funny. This is your misspellings, and the colors are off, and the application looks right. You just gotta look at it, and yeah, okay. So why am I telling you about these three, uh, three kinds of bugs? Is because these three kinds of bugs have really different life cycle. So let's look at the logical bugs again. It's the scorpions, right? These are by far the most common bugs you're gonna be facing day to day, right? This is what our bread and butter is about. It's about writing code and getting these particular corner cases right. Now, it turns out these bugs are also very difficult to find because these are the kind of bugs that only happen on the leap year, on the end of Christmas, you know, whatever the Zoom thing bug was that Microsoft had, right? These are really hard and weird corner cases that when they occur. And more importantly, it's really difficult to fix them because if you go and find this particular bug, the probability that you can fix it and not cause a new bug is actually rather high. So it's very likely that you can, uh, by, by fixing this particular corner case, you're actually introducing a different one or you're breaking something else. And I call this the logical bugs, and it turns out there's an antidote to these particular class of bugs, and that's unit tests. Because what unit tests are is really, uh, 
a your understanding of what the code is supposed to be doing. It's your assumptions about the code, right? You have enumerated inside of your unit test all of the assumptions you had in your head when you were writing it. And these assumptions are now staying there as specs and therefore anybody else who comes along, they can change it. Uh, sorry, they can re-verify that these assumptions were not broken. And that's what really they are. Now wiring bugs, uh, those are again the issue between contracts and those are relatively easily solved through scenario runners. So if you can get your application up and if you can send a single email, then chances are most of the major systems are properly wired. You know, if you miswired something, usually the server doesn't start up, the email doesn't get sent, or some horrible exception happens, and it usually happens right at the beginning. Uh, so the solution over there is having unit uh, scenario tests or the end-to-end -end tests. And finally, the rendering bug, you know, if you have misspellings, there really isn't a good solution over there. But luckily, they're easy to spot and easy to fix. So when you write your code, that's kind of the way you have to think about it. So you say, aha, but my code is different, is always this line. People always say, I'm different. Yes, I know, you're different, just like everybody else. Um, I have a super bug. My bug is all three of them at the same time. And the answer to that is that's because you have super code. In other words, you have mixed your uh, logic and the new operators, right? I said the code should be either factories or the code should be business logic. And by separating them out, you are also separating the bugs. And by separating the bugs, you, are, you can also separate the kind of tests you can write to verify that they're correct. By having these monolithic applications, which is, which is which, where, where the classes are responsible for both creation of the dependencies as well as doing the business logic, you're going to have a really hard time writing unit tests because everything is together and um, you won't be able to nicely separate them out. Anyways, that brings us to Q&A. Yes. I, is there a second mic or do we, how do we do this? The mics are broken. Okay, I'm going to repeat your question. So my question to you is that we're constantly facing a problem that we use an internal library like database, yes. you know, network library, but they have a particular way to use it, like in you know, a create a transaction, use that transaction, and that transaction return a future to you. Mm -hmm. so it's more like the problem you just described, like you know, money in your pocket. But we are we 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 have we are forced to use this model because mm -hmm. that's an API. So how? Right. So the question is basically, suppose you're using a third-party library and a third-party library authors have never heard of testing and so they designed their application, their, their code base or the library to be very test unfriendly. What do you do then? Uh, this happens all the time and there's actually a very simple solution to that, which is that instead of using the library, you create your own facade in front of the library. And this is nice because you can say, you know, usually libraries are complicated because they want to cover a lot of different use cases. But you're, and because of that, you're, the, the interface of the library is more complicated than it needs to be. So if you create a facade for, for just for your application, the facade tends to be a lot simpler than the actual library API. So that's a good thing. And because it's a facade, then you can easily write a mock or a, or a emulator for this particular facade, which should be relatively straightforward. And so you're doing two things. You're simplifying the way you're calling this stuff, and you're also making your stuff isolated so that you can test it. Now, once you have a facade, you're gonna to have to write an adapter to kind of bridge the facade with the actual API, and you're gonna have a horrible time testing the adapter because the adapter will have to talk to the real thing. Uh, but fortunately, um, the adapter usually are pretty straightforward and simple. Uh, so that even if you're going to have a hard time writing the test, you still should be able to write the test. And even if you say, forget it, I give up, I'm not writing a test for this thing, you're still better off because at least you can test all of your code. So that's the answer. Yes? So um, I agree with all of the proof, everything uh, about sort of constructing a test case to be testable. But my one question about dependencies and I think about uh, dependency injection mm -hmm. um, is uh, do you follow that, and, and, and in all your examples, but I mean, do you follow that same principle in Ruby, for example, where you can replace the instructor at one time? Yes, so the question is, the, is dependency injection uh, universal or is it specific to a set of languages? And there is a group, uh, the, the Ruby folks especially, seem to think that dependency injection doesn't apply to them. Uh, I actually, uh, the most polite way I would like to disagree with this particular point of view because the only reason why uh, you can, uh, you, you don't have to use that is because you can monkey patch things, 
And monkey patching is wrong because it's essentially changing the global state. So you are trading one problem for another problem. It is true that in Java, if you don't have these seams, you're simply screwed and your testing story is simply not there and chances are you just can't do it. Whereas in Ruby, even if you write your application in the most horrible way, chances are that you can somehow monkey patch it into submission. But it doesn't mean that it's a good idea. The other thing that dependency injection does that I really like is that it makes it really uh, obvious to people what are the true dependencies, right? Uh, there isn't any of this magic. You know, the, the, I, I was trying to use Ruby on Rails for a while and I was always frustrated with this magic where like you do something and it just works and you go like, I know you just work, but how, how does this work? Like you need to get a hold of the certificates and the usernames and passwords and the database connection and all these things. Where did you pull this old stuff out of, right? And is this always this global state that just exists in a system which makes this magic work that is troublesome? And so what I like about dependency injection is it makes the classes be very honest. They say, look, I need A, B, and C to get my job done. And then people usually say, well, but dependency injection bloats your constructors and there are these horrible beasts that, you know, you know makes it look horrible. And, and that's really why people tend to not like dependency injection. But the reality of it is the dependency injection is really just the messenger. And it's telling you, look, your class has these horrible dependencies. I'm just making it obvious. And now you're screaming down the messenger because like, I'm just telling you the truth. Like, don't, don't shoot the messenger. That's not my fault that you have these dependencies, right? So if you don't like the dependencies you have, it is up to you to go and rearrange them, refactor them, create other classes you know, that are simpler and so on. So I, I'm really of the opinion that dependency injection is, is, is useful in all different languages. So I've so far worked in Java, uh, uh, Ruby, uh, JavaScript, Python. Uh, another point in JavaScript is JavaScript is also of the opinion that you can monkey patch everything. Um, and I'm author of AngularJS. And one of the things that we have placed in AngularJS is actually dependency injection system. Uh, and most, for the most part, people love us for it. It's very unique. It allows us to get rid of the main methods. It allows us to have a very beautiful testing story. It makes it easier to understand how the application is put together. So I, I think the same applies to Ruby. So I think it's a universal statement that dependency injection is a good idea. Yes? In the refactoring example, you discuss changes you have to make to the clients of your class. Okay, so the question is that when I, I think if I understand correctly, is that when I wrote the, uh, the, the test, I have changed the API. Um, so that's true, uh, and it was, I think there was also a second question in there, which was, you know, what if you need some other dependency in there? And I'll answer those two questions separately. So it is true that when you write tests, um, first especially, you are really changing the way the, the, the API is and also the, uh, the, uh, the, the constructors are. So in a way, you are dictating these things. But this is just coming back to the whole dependency injection story, which is that you're just making the classes be honest about what are the true dependencies are. Now, what if you all of a sudden need to get a hold of a new dependency? You know, uh, what then? Well, this is where dependency injection really, really shines. Because if you need to get a hold of a new dependency in the classical system, you have two choices. You can either make it, but sometimes you can't make it because you need to actually reuse some other instance. And so then you have to get a singleton going. And in other words, you have to have a global variable. And the reason you have to have this is because suppose this thing gets created somewhere over here and like 20 layers down over there, uh, you need to uh, get a hold of it. And so instead of going through every single class and passing it through, you say, well, I'm just going to put it in this singleton and then look it up from over there to get it. And I'm sure you've all done this bad. So dependency injection solves this because it turns out, uh, and this is not obvious, you have to kind of use it for a while. It turns out uh, because you pull out all of the constructor code and you kind of turn it inside out, it turns out you can simply just add a new dependency uh, into the, the particular class that you're working on without affecting any of the classes that happen to be above you. And the reason for that is because no, one, no class is responsible for making its dependencies. It simply is responsible for asking for them. 
And so the, the, the problem falls onto the factory. And usually, factories see the whole world because that's their job, is to put the world together. And so the factory has a really easy job to say, oh, this thing I made over here, I also need to pass it over there, and so it simply passes it. So dependency injection actually makes this particular problem a lot easier. Other questions? Yes? You're talking about this pyramid? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Should all those levels of testing be done by the developer? Is that what Ah, good question. Oh, here it is. Should all these levels be done by the developer? Uh, that's, a, that's a hard question. Uh, to some degree, yes, but on most projects, even the ones I work on, the answer is probably no. Uh, I really feel very strongly that the developer is responsible for writing the unit tests. If the developer doesn't write the unit tests, everything else falls apart. But it turns out that if you get the unit testing right, then all the other pieces automatically become correct as well. So if you have proper dependency injection on unit tests, you will also have proper dependency injection on uh, component level, which will also mean that you will be able to write uh, functional tests and scenario tests, and you'll be able to mock out different parts of the system. Typically, the way it breaks down on large projects is that uh, developers are responsible for unit tests, uh, usually they're responsible for functional tests, uh, but then somebody else is responsible for really for the end-to-end -end scenario framework, and also for, usually we don't write scenario tests in the actual uh, language like Java or JavaScript, but, but rather we write them in um, given when then syntax, which is usually some files or some scripts, or usually it's just not programmed code. So they're responsible for kind of setting up the vocabulary, kind of the DSL of the application, right? Because you don't want to be clicking on individual things. You want to write a test that says, you know, when I, when I log in as Joe into my inbox and I send an email to Mary and then I log in as Mary, I should see the email. Like that's the, what the test should say. The test should not say, you know, click on this input box, put this text over there, click on that thing, put that right. You, you lose the story of the test. You lose the meaning of the test if you, if you don't have a good DSL, domain specific language, to kind of express what the intent of the, the test is. So usually uh, that's a separate responsibility that somebody else works on. More questions, yes. In the systems where the bugs are few? Yeah, very few bugs. So I guess what I'm trying to ask is, how do you get to zero bugs? So, uh, yeah, ah, how do you get to zero bugs? Uh, you delete all your code? That's <laughs> 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 uh, So you will have bugs all the time, even with writing tests. But you will have, A, fewer bugs. And B, you're gonna spend less time on figuring out what these bugs are. And when you finally discover them, you're gonna be able to write a unit test to prevent their reoccurrence. Because I'm sure you've been on projects where you fix the same bug over and over again, right? Because there's just some assumption that was left out of the testing story. And then because new people come on a project, they forget, they don't, they're not aware of this assumption and they keep breaking it over and over again. And so tests will be a good thing over there. Uh, getting to zero bugs, you know, I think that's uh, to some degree a myth, but you know, that doesn't mean we shouldn't keep trying and we shouldn't asymptotically approach that goal. Uh, and I think unit tests are a good way of getting there. The other thing I wanted to talk about tests is that people, and I should have mentioned this, is that when people develop code, they do it in a way where they the API of the code base is incidental. In other words, they start working on the if statements and the while loops and things, and eventually they say, oh, I should turn this into some API, and so they just slap something on top of it. What the tests make you do is the other way around. They make you write a piece of code from the user's perspective using the API where the implementation becomes incidental. And by flipping that around, it turns out you get a much richer, cleaner separation between components and all the, all the things. And the reason is very simple, which is that nobody in the right mind will write a complicated test. Right? You, you always write the simplest possible thing in terms of a test that you can think of, provided that you're not um, encumbered by some existing code. 
Yes. I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time hearing you. Do I have recommendations for testing factory patterns? Yeah, factory patterns that provide the application or the environment context that is Yes. OK. So how would you test factories? So we said that it's easy to test uh, if statements and loops, et cetera, inside of unit tests. But it's also easy to test factories provided one critical piece of information. And that is that you're either in a business of doing stuff or you're in a business of building stuff. Right? You're never into doing both. So it turns out that if the factory really does nothing but co constructs your application, then it's easy to test because you can say, go build me the whole thing, right? and, and it builds everything, and then you can go and actually assert that the right things are hooked up to the right stuff. But if the factory builds your application and then immediately goes and executes it, the game's over. So it's very important that if you're in a business of building stuff, you're only in a business of building stuff and not doing any work. Because building stuff means calling the constructors. This is the reason why you don't want to have any sort of work inside of the constructors. Because you want to be able to test the factors. You want to be able to say, go build me this particular subsystem of my application so that later I can write an a, um, a assertion about you know, what's hooked up to work and you know, the, the right parameters got passed places. But I don't want to actually execute the application. Whereas if you write the unit test, then you're actually saying, I'm building a very tiny subset of my application and I'm actually executing it by having certain dependencies marked out. And so those are two very distinct things. And you can do both, again, provided that you separated them out. If you don't separate them out, the game's over.